Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm Frat Demir from OU Center for Peace and Development, Department of Economics, and also the Security and Context Network. Um, our distinguished guest today is James Galbraith, who is the Lloyd Benson Chair of uh, Professor in, of Government Business Relations and Professor of Government at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas, Austin. Dr. Galbraith uh, was the Executive Director of the Joint Economic Committee of the U.S. Congress and an economist for the House Banking Committee. He chaired the Board of Economists for Peace and Security and directs the University of Texas Inequality Project. He is a managing editor of the Structural Change and Economic Dynamics and a lifetime member of the Council on Foreign Relations. In 2014, Dr. Galbraith was co-winner of the prestigious Leon Tief Prize for Advancing the Frontiers of Economics. And in 2020, he received the Webland Commons Award of the Association for Evolutionary Economics. He is the author of dozens of academic articles and books. His most recent books include Welcome to the Poisoned Chalice, The Destruction of Greece and the Future of Europe from Yale University Press in 2016, and Inequality, What Everyone Needs to Know from Oxford University Press in 2016. We will have the Q&A at the end of the, of the talk, uh, but those of you who are participating online, please feel free to use the Q&A option to post your questions anytime. We'll take them in the, in the same order at the end of the lecture. Uh, and we'll make our recording available online. So if you want to share later on, feel free to reach out to CPD webpage uh, where we will post the recording. The title of his talk today is The Quasi-Inflation of 21-22, A Case of Bad Analysis and Worse Policies. Professor Garbrit, welcome. And I'll leave it, the floor to you. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Let me first of all e ex express my pleasure at being here. This is, I think, the first trip I have taken to give a live presentation uh, since the since the start of the pandemic. And I simply could not resist the, the, the uh, uh, temptation offered by Firat uh, to, uh, to to come here, in part because uh, this is I've, I've been to this university once before. Uh, and it was a it was a great pleasure then. It's a great pleasure now. Uh, uh, not least because of the of the grace and the beauty of this campus, um, and but also because uh, the invitation to speak at a, a center for peace and development uh, was simply uh, uh, well, it seemed to me to be a civic responsibility to take up the invitation and just leave it that way. So uh, then the question came as to what uh, to to speak on, uh, and uh, this is I think quite a, a a mixed audience. So I, I have uh, my thought is to to do a, a couple of things. We have quite a lot of time uh, in the course of the of, of the next hour. Uh, we'll see. We'll, we'll see how it goes. The first is to give um, a presentation of a paper, uh, which is the title of this uh, of this talk: the quasi inflation of 2021 2022, uh, which is forthcoming in the review of of Keynesian economics uh, and deals with, uh, out of uh, what I, I believe is a fairly general and accessible level, a question of, of, of public controversy and current policy, which is to say, uh, what has, uh, how the events of the last couple of years uh, transpired, how they were interpreted, what kind of policy response they, they evoked and uh, the appropriateness of that response. Uh, it is set in a somewhat broader context of, uh, let's call it a general critique of the way in which uh, the leading figures in uh, in the economics profession, uh, particularly macroeconomics, tend to approach policy questions. That's uh, sort of the, 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 the uh, that's a, a theme which is um, repeated over a number of different topics in, in the work that I'm engaged on at the moment. Uh, so I wanna talk about that. Uh, and if there is time and there's interest, and particularly for those of you who may have, uh, you know, a more uh, technical uh, disposition, uh, there's a second set of issues that are closely related, which deal with the, uh, the way in which the Federal Reserve has historically reacted to economic events. Uh, and there's some, there's some uh, technical analysis uh, that I can talk about. And that is a paper which was first done 15 years ago uh, and uh, 
that was uh, convicted of les majeste and therefore proved to be unpublishable uh but it will finally be published uh, in the uh uh in, in in the near future uh and it has some bearing uh whether the past is a predictor of of future performance is always a question, but it has some bearing on 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 issues that will be coming up in a year or so. Uh, so we can proceed, and if we have time with uh, uh, to to cover the second topic, we'll do that, uh, and hope with plenty of time to for for conversation afterwards. In any event, let me turn to the question of of inflation, and uh, I just want to preface this by a comment with which I opened the paper, which is. Uh, inflation is often paired in our understanding as economists with unemployment, but these are really two very different ideas. They're conceptually from a different space. The word unemployment is a, is a term which has a, you know, it has a practical and precise technical meaning uh, that originated with, as far as I understand, the commissioner of labor, labor in the state of, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in the period after the Civil War. Uh, you are either unemployed or you're not, and there's a particular definition. You're so you can work and not able to obtain it at the prevailing wage, uh, and that is was created and adopted for administrative reasons. And then the question becomes one of counting the number of people who are in that category. Inflation is something else entirely. Inflation is a condition of the of of, of the economy as a whole of the uh, and it is something which is largely a uh, let let's call it a theoretical construct. Uh, and so it's, I think, useful to begin by trying to clarify what we mean by the term. Uh, there is, of course, a purely I'll call prosaic definition, which uh, was offered by uh, my friend Jared Bernstein, now serving in a high position in the administration, of, uh, Ernie Tedeschi of the staff of the Council of Human Advisors, who said, okay, it's just the rate of change of pr in prices over time. Uh, which uh, well, is a serviceable definition, but not a very illuminating. Uh, and what I would suggest is that uh, one should distinguish between um, the kind of inflation, what economists tend to talk about when they think when they when they discuss inflation in the textbook or theoretical context, uh, and what actually happens most of the time in most economies. So the pure the pure concept of inflation. Uh, is uh, a diff an undifferentiated increase in prices associated with devaluation of the monetary unit. Right? So everything essentially uh, in the framework of, uh, of, of, of money neutrality, double all prices and, uh, and so on and so forth. And that was what uh, I think it's fair to say Milton Friedman had in mind uh, when he offered the idea that uh, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Um, well, at the other pole, uh, I'll just call it everyday inflation, that's my coinage, uh, which is to say what happens when uh, in a real economy, when some, uh, let's say, particularly a core commodity, let's say oil and gas, uh, rise in price and this as a resource cost passes through the structure of prices and, uh, and uh, has repercussions across the various sectors of the economy. And by the way, one other reason for, for wanting to talk about this here is that I uh, realize I'm in oil and gas country. And so if there's a possibility I may be saying things to people who know a great deal more about this particular area than I do. In fact, it's more than a possibility. I take it as, a, as, as practically certain, in which case that will, that will help me uh, you know, clarify my understanding of what's been happening. But in any event, that's the general idea. And one can allow for the for the possibility that um, that there's a, some combination of things, what one might call, a, I would call a hybrid or persistent everyday inflation, which was the way I would characterize the experience of the 1970s, in which various uh, shocks uh, affected the, the economy on a global basis, and then passed through uh, the structure of prices and also wages in a way that caused those shocks to be of uh, relatively long lasting in certain certain settings, particularly where there were strong unions capable of uh, of incorporating the higher cost of living in their wage demands and, and then 
of having a set of, of, of well, let's say, ratchet effects on other players in the society. Uh, and that um, it was much, much more serious in the UK and the US than it was, for example, in Japan. Uh, but uh, uh, there's a feature of the 1970s. OK, uh, the question then is, what kind of inflation have we just experienced? And my view is this was everyday inflation. This was everyday, it was not hybrid, and it was not the pure uh, variety. Uh, and of course, the uh, preeminent source, but not the only one, uh, that drove this uh, uh, increase in the cost structure was the price of oil and associated possibly the price of gas, but the price of oil is the primary one. Uh, which, as I think you probably remember, uh, as I'm sure it was embedded in the local uh, news, uh, fell to a very low level in the at the start of the of the pandemic in, in 2020. In fact, future prices went negative briefly, um, and then of course uh, there was a, a recovery of demand, uh, as there would naturally be, but also uh, a, an increase in supply with a simple proposition that the increase in supply was slower than the increase in demand, leaving a position of excess demand, which enabled the, 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 the price to go up, which was a windfall for anybody who was actually producing. Uh, now, why did this happen? Um, that's a good question. And I, I don't know the answer, and I hope to be given the benefit of, of your information. Uh, but I would say the two possibilities are the two factors are one, the geology of the region and the ability to bring uh, wells which have been closed back online, which may be compromised by the forces of time and sand accumulating and this kind of thing. Uh, and the second being well, the fact that when uh, the, 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 uh, when the the pickings were good when the price was low, the oil fields themselves were properties that sold at very favorable prices and private equity moved in. And I can read this in the press uh, and you can pick out the stories in which the companies say, we have a strategy and our strategy is maximize our shareholder value, uh, which means that we are not going to maximize the output of the wells, but rather take advantage of, the, of, of this differential between the growth of demand and the growth of supply. Well, okay, we can, we can see uh, uh, whether uh, there's some some view about the the depth of that particular insight, but it certainly shows up if you read uh, the Houston Press or the press in the in the in the Texas Panhandle. Uh, so that's one and probably the principal source, uh, I would argue. Second source, which we're I think all familiar with, uh, was the disruption of the supply chain and particularly in affecting automobiles, and it was particularly a shortage of semiconductors, which was due to the fact that um, the uh, semiconductors are the ultimate roundabout capital good. Uh, they take a long time to produce, like six months for a single chip, uh, which is really, I mean, if you think about it, quite quite an amazing thing. I mean, these things have to be, the lamination has to be done again and again. Uh, and the uh, producers uh, just miscalculated what the demand would be, uh, where it would go. They thought it would be mostly household electronics and appliances, and it turned out people wanted to buy cars and the semiconductors were not available. And when uh, the cars can't be produced, the effect is on the used car market. The new car market, the price goes up a little bit, but new car producers basically are, are, are tracking their costs. The used car market is a free market in which it's an asset market and whatever you want to pay, they, <laughs> they'll happily take. And that's where that's where the major impact on the cost of uh, the consumer price index will occur. And the third area, which I have to say, I do not understand yet as well as I would like to, is housing, uh, which has gone up now to something like 38% of the, of the CPI, I think at the most recent uh, rebasing. Um, and in housing, the housing component is based on rentals. And rentals are um, imputed for homeowners, but the rental market is not the same as the home owned market. The, the units are of lower quality, the turnover is more rapid, uh, and the market in the United States is relatively thin uh, for new rentals. Uh, so that you would expect this, this the effect of that price on the rent that you are imputed to pay yourself as a homeowner uh, is a very peculiar thing to have 
fitting in the cost of in, in the consumer price index. Uh, I'm quite happy to have whatever inflation is associated with an increase in the imputed rent of my home, which has absolutely no effect on my economic growth. So that that's the third thing that's going on in the in the in the what I would call the everyday inflation. None of this really has to do with macroeconomic policy, and I'll come to the to the relationship. But I also want to say a word about the question of of persistence, uh, which turned out to be a major element uh, in the uh, in driving the policy response uh, to, um, uh, to to these developments. The first is that, uh, to some degree, persistence is a just a function of the of, of the the way and what the time it takes for things to pass through the economy. Oil price goes up. The oil price is, as far as I know, not part of the consumer price index because very few of us buy oil for. Uh, uh, you know, home consumption. Uh, it's we buy what we buy is gasoline, uh, a refined product, and the the it's the distributor that buys the oil and raises the price, and they will not buy. Uh, they won't lower the price until they've gotten another load, which is of lower price. So, the, uh, oil prices finished in March of 2021. Gasoline prices finished rising in June of 22. The second thing, which I think is really quite significant lies in the fact that for, I think, good reasons, uh, the, uh, the official statistics uh, for the consumer price index are reported, the headline number is a 12 month, uh, one, you know, from 12 months previously, it's a year over year number, uh, rather than a one month number. Well, of course, that reduces the volatility. That's a good reason to do this. But at the same time, it means that if there happens to be a spike, let's say in May of 2020, 2021, then uh, that number is going to be repeated in the news 11 more times, even if nothing much happens. And that gives you, uh, if you happen to be, oh, I don't want to uh, 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 name names, but if you happen to be Larry Summers, uh, then uh, you have 11 more opportunities to write about this in the Washington Post. Uh, and this gives you a certain weight uh, in the policy debate and it's a really terrific advantage over people like me saying, you know, once in a while in Project Syndicate uh, that this is going to end. Uh, well, okay, uh, you know, uh, it is what it is. Uh, but here's Larry, uh, in May of 2021, inflationary pressures are mounting from the boost in demand created by the two trillion plus in savings that Americans have accumulated during the pandemic from large scale Federal Reserve debt purchases, along with Fed forecasts of essentially zero interest rates into 2024, from roughly 3 trillion in fiscal stimulus passed by Congress and from soaring stock and real estate prices. Now that's a very peculiar argument uh, from a very uh, highly credentialed professional economist. I have never heard anybody argue that savings are inflationary. Savings are the opposite of inflationary. Savings are what you don't spend, not what you do spend. Uh, the forecasts of zero interest rates are per se inflationary. Well, this is, gives to the forecasters at the Federal Reserve a really magical power over the national psyche, and it amazes me, and soaring stock and real estate prices. Stocks, corporate stocks are assets. They're not, they're not consumable goods, uh, real estate, is an asset. It also is not a consumable good. These things may impact the, the consumer price index in various ways, land prices. Uh, but this is technically not, not, not the, what we consider when we think about the rising price of things which are being produced and consumed. And you know what's not being mentioned here? Oil is not being mentioned. Semiconductors are not being mentioned. It's quite, I thought this was quite, quite a remarkable statement and well worth documenting and, 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 and remembering. Uh, more examples, Ken Rogoff in May of 2022, he's not going to blame the Fed, but he points uh, to other people who are doing so. Uh, Jason Furman in August of 2022, uh, who speaks speaking of recent price and wage growth data. So he puts the finger on wage growth, make it increasingly clear that the U.S. economy's underlying inflation rate is at least 4% and more likely to be rising than falling with a clear prescription that the Federal Reserve will need 
uh, to uh, uh, stick to its plan of rapid interest rate hikes. And I can't resist recalling Franklin Roosevelt's great campaign battle cry of 1940, Martin, Barton, and Fish, the, uh, at the, uh, at Madison Square Garden. So I will update it to Jason, Larry, and Ken as the uh, as 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 the bet noirs of my uh, of, of of my morning here. Um, but anyway, here's Jason again in September of 2022. So this is really quite recent. We're only now in March of 2023. The scariest economic paper of 2022 argues that labor markets remain extremely tight, underlying inflation is high and possibly rising, and several years of very high unemployment may be necessary to get inflation under control. To get the inflation rate to the Fed's target of 2% by then would require an average unemployment rate of about 6.5% in 2023 and 2024. Uh, so this is really quite laying down the line and the law to the to the to authorities that the inflation the unemployment rate needs to double in order to bring the inflation rate under control. Uh, Professor Furman uh, did not volunteer to join the unemployed effort. Uh, uh, so that uh, I just it's also worth worth noting. Um, okay, here's a. I, I can't resist uh, that by the end of November, of course, the, the air was fading from this balloon at a very rapid rate. Here's the Financial Times, uh, November 27th, 2022. Global inflation likely to have peaked, and the same was true in the United States. Factory gate prices, shipping rates, commodity prices, inflation expectations have all begun to subside from their recent re record levels. This is only a few weeks after we heard from the most heavily credentialed and prominent economists in the country uh, that this was going to be persistent for two more years. And guess what? It wasn't. Uh, the news started changing almost immediately after the election. All right. What was behind the uh, analysis uh, of our uh, distinguished friends uh, and this I say, yes, I say, feeding on the illusion of persistence. Well, the first one is, is our old friend, the Phillips curve, uh, the idea that there's a stable trade off uh, between inflation and unemployment, which was uh, uh, born in 1960 in the famous uh, Samuelson Solo article, uh, and uh, it was pretty well finished by the early 1970s, uh, but has somehow kept on in the textbooks and in the minds of of economists, uh, so the act of forgetting that should have occurred long ago. 1973 is, by my calculation, of five decades past. Uh, should should have occurred, but appears not to have. Uh, but of course, in the 70s, this was all transmuted into uh, the natural rate of unemployment or the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, the NIRU, which was uh, birthed by Ned Phelps and Milton Friedman in 67, 68, and uh, became really part of the dogma in the early 70s, which led to a, 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 a further fear. The standard uh, Phillips curve argument was that if you reduce the unemployment rate, inflation would rise to a certain level. But the Nairu natural rate argument was that if you tried to reduce the unemployment rate, inflation would accelerate, that, it was that the whole system was intrinsically unstable. Um, and therefore, the only thing to do was to leave unemployment to the labor market to be settled and let the central bank target the inflation rate, uh, which uh, was uh, became the, the fashionable doctrine um, although it was not entirely unchallenged. Uh, and I give you two articles that were published both in the Journal of Economic Perspectives um, with, uh, with some time lag between them. Uh, one of them in 1997 and the other one in 2018, which uh, I my official calculations give a difference of 21 years between those two. Dates, uh, which was time enough for me to raise two daughters to voting age. Uh, and uh, Olivier Blanchard comes along with the very modestly phrased uh, title, uh, should we reject the natural rate of uh, a uh, uh, hypothesis? And in, in, in that, uh, the, uh, 
he says uh, wonderfully in the in the abstract that it would be uh, he suggests that economists might quote keep an open mind and put some weight on the alternatives. And I, I write that, that there's just no sign that this wise advice uh, had any influence on the profession, any of it. Better late than never, but uh, it is uh, a question that needs to be thought about. All right, allowing that the policy should be to target inflation, if that's what the economists think should do, the question then becomes, how do you do it? Uh, and uh, there was a solution which was associated with the monetarists uh, that uh, uh, was strongly advocated through the 1970s and finally put into effect theoretically mm -hmm. up to a point with some reservations mm -hmm. by the Paul Volcker Federal Reserve in 1979. Uh, Volcker came in in the summer and, and started the major uptick of interest rates almost shortly after that. In 1982, uh, it was abandoned. It was abandoned in the teeth of a recession which had produced 10% unemployment in the United States, but also uh, the crisis of the third world debt, Mexico's threatened default uh, and the interest. And I have to say, uh, I will confess to having a small role here that at the Joint Economic Committee, I was busy drafting congressional uh, resolutions directing the Federal Reserve to change its policy. And there was a, a moment when, when the Federal Reserve liaison came to see me and said, how do we get rid of these resolutions? And I said, you know, Don, if the interest rates start to fall, probably the wind will, will go out of my sails on this. And it is true that the interest rate started to fall not long after that. So uh, I don't want to claim post hoc, it'd be fall victim to post hoc ergo propter hoc, but there's some possibility that that was, had something to do with it. Any event, what happened after that was they went back to targeting short-term interest rates, which they actually control. Uh, and reinforce that by talking to the public, largely through the framework of congressional hearings, the Humphrey Hawkins hearings, which uh, also were my my creation. To I was the staff person on the banking committee from seventy five to nineteen eighty, while I was in graduate school, uh, who administered those hearings, organized them, uh, and that created, um, much to my chagrin, a powerful framework for the Federal Reserve to to actually communicate policy to the to the to the um, uh, to the public, uh, creating a, a whole industry of people who try to read the tea leaves of what the Federal Reserve is going to do. Uh, but anyway, that's where we are. Those were the base. That was the basic uh, uh, strategy uh, with the problem that its efficacy in terms of inflation is completely unknowable because there was none after 1982 for the next 40 years or uh, 39 years. There was nothing to test it on. There was no they. Commodity prices basically collapsed in the middle 80s and the rise of China uh, and uh, the uh, deindustrialization and the weakening of American unions. There was simply nothing, uh, no, no, nothing more for this policy to be to work against. So it has I've always uh, um, compared it to the, the, the little Dutch boy with his finger in the dike sitting there priding himself on holding back the flood and he never looks up over the levee to find that the lake is completely dry. Uh, so that, you know, the congress self congratulation by central bankers is a feature of the of culture. Any of it. So that was one set of approaches dealing sort of with the relationship between inflation and unemployment. And then there was a second one, which is we'll called the output gap approach, which is a calculation of economic slack estimated as the difference between something uh, hypothetical potential GDP and the actual number, uh, which has the problem uh, that it relies on the assumption that the slump uh, is due to a deficient demand that is not due to something like rising resource costs or structural change, technological change. Uh, and therefore there is a gap, right? Which again, is a useful, uh, heuristic, if you like, uh, if what you want to do is support the case for stimulus policy for, for short-term Keynesian policies, uh, because then there is a gap you can fill. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it has two major shortcomings. One is that it weighs against the idea that you should do anything in the long term, because that gap is hypothetically going to be filled over time anyway, 
and the question is just how quickly. Uh, and the idea is that if you take a long a long term approach and launch major infrastructure investment projects, uh, that those will come online after the economy is back at full potential, and you're simply fueling inflation again. Uh, and uh, the uh, that that was a problem in particular in 2009 with with the forecasts that uh, uh, were, were were built into the actually in the late Bush administration that the Obama administration simply accepted. Uh, so that's the output get approach. But the question is, uh, is that caution justified in the structure of the economy as it is now? Uh, Summers again made this case uh, in 2021. Um, but I'll come back to Milton Friedman, on whom I do not rely very often. Uh, uh, but uh, in 1957, Friedman had an insight for which he was given the economics version of the Nobel Prize, uh, which may be useful here. And that's the permanent income hypothesis. And the, his argument, which was directed against stimulus policy, was that if you give people a windfall, they simply keep their permanent levels of income and consumption stable and they, they absorb the rest as savings and then draw those down over time only when, they're, when, when they feel secure about this. Uh, well, if that argument was good against a stimulus policy, it also is an argument against the idea that giving people money uh, is going to be inflationary because it will automatically produce a, white, a wave of, of new spending. Uh, and we could look at, yes, Friedman, uh, the, uh, um, what happened in 2021. And there's some interesting work on this, actually, cite the Peterson Foundation uh, for a paper on this, uh, which is that if you take the bottom three quarters of American households, maintaining their customary spending was roughly what they did with unemployment insurance and the uh, taxpayer rebates and so forth. They didn't go out on a spending spree. Uh, and they quite reasonably, um, but they'd also lost their income. So they would they didn't have a lot of savings out of this either. They were they were they were simply kept held harmless, maybe a little improved in some respects. At the bottom, poverty rates actually fell. This was a good thing, but hardly inflationary that people were were able to improve their, for example, their food budget and reduce food hunger. This was good, uh, but again, hardly inflationary. Uh, it was at the upper end that the savings accumulated. And why was that? The upper end did not have a large gain in incomes. They did not get a large part of this benefit from the federal stimulus. They were mostly on their existing salaries uh, and, uh, and asset base. They were, they were, they were not affected people like us, who are presumably working in universities, our salaries continued to be paid. But what happened to us was that a lot of our activities, which were the consumption of services, became unavailable. Restaurants, and I don't know uh, how many of the distinguished audience here spends time in tattoo parlors, but you know, this kind of thing, uh, that sort of spending was, uh, no longer available. So we went out and walked around the parks and did other things that didn't, didn't cost any money. And the funds piled up. And what did we do with them? Well, we went out and we bought, well, some of us bought, we bought extra real estate or we bought, we invested in the stock market or whatever it was. We bought assets. We diversified our portfolios. We didn't hold it in cash, particularly not at 0% interest rates. And so there was a of, uh, an understandable increase in the prices of a whole series of, of assets, uh, which is what uh, Summers was was worried about as inflation. But as I say, also uh, we bought we bought cars, which is a capital asset, uh, and appliances, uh, and renovated housing, and that was then you could see the effect of that on the queue of of container ships that were piling up at Long Beach and Los Angeles at the peak of this, this crisis. Okay. Uh, all right. So again, I've, I've made the point that asset prices are not inflation in principle. What we normally refer to this phenomenon is, is the word we normally use is boom uh, and or bubble. Uh, and bubbles uh, are, are uh, the temporary phenomenon in any event. Uh, okay. The Federal Reserve 
reacted under partly under the pressure of uh, the, the political pressure it was under and partly under um, whatever else was guiding its its policy. Uh, the president, President Biden, said effectively, it's the Fed's job to deal with this, which passed, except for one crucial respect, passed the responsibility uh, to the Federal Reserve. And again, it raised the pressure on them. The crucial exception was sales of oil from the Strategic Reserve, which uh, are going to have and did have a dramatic effect on the underlying structure of costs. But in beginning in early 2022, the Federal Reserve began to raise interest rates and have persistently been raising them since. Just as the inflation pressures or the cost pressures were getting set to peak just a few months later. I'll just say there is no reason in any economics I have ever heard or know of to believe that a rise of interest rates in January is going to cure an ingrained inflation expectation, persistent inflation phenomenon as early as June. If you believe that, you know, that we can believe you do believe in magic, uh, they, but I don't believe in magic. I believe that the Federal Reserve waved its wand and got credit for an event which was already baked in, uh, in, in at the, especially January, March, when the, when the, when the interest rate prices were increased or were, were underway. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, come to December, and what do you know? Uh, we get the PC <coughs> price index down to 0 0.3, down to 0 0.2, uh, and various headlines fed in a flutter as US inflation softens. Um, with the CPI, PPI import prices, and now most significantly, the core PC deflator pointing to weakening weakening price pressures, the Federal Reserve's hawkish messaging is being questioned by the market. All right, so that's where we are. What are the consequences of the policy? Well, the housing boom has ended uh, and the stock market has uh, come down. The tech sector, which funds itself substantially off of uh, capital inflows rather than revenues, uh, was um, came under financial pressure, and, and, and we began to see large cuts in employment in that sector. Uh, the dollar stayed up, which tells you that this is not a, a pure inflation. This is not a, there's no devaluation of the monetary unit. Uh, American banks benefit from that. Other banks, Europeans, Swiss, with dollar liabilities, are under pressure. Uh, the yield curve is flat or inverted. Uh, and that is a pretty good indicator that sooner or later uh, things will, will uh, the larger uh, uh, production system will, will turn down. Uh, when that will happen, we don't know. And I've been very careful. I don't want to say, and others have said, Elizabeth Warren and others in the political space have, have said this is impending recession. Maybe, maybe not. The fact is, again, come back to the, to the elasticity of the credit markets. When households come under pressure, they can borrow in a way that they could not do 50, 60, 100 years ago. And so they're able to sustain their activity and businesses too for a certain amount of time, but not indefinitely. Uh, and that's the issue here. Uh, the Fed, on the other hand, uh, is in a bind. Uh, the the uh, underlying rationale for its policy has dis largely disappeared. Uh, but if it were to back down, it would look very feckless uh, and lose its credibility. It has a, essentially the Vietnam problem. Uh, it can't get out, even though the, the, uh, the, the events have long since overtaken the policymakers. Uh, so, and I would say also, and I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up more or less on this, that there are still price risks out there. Uh, one is gross markups, uh, which is clearly there's a profit element in this a cost pressure, which happens to the fact that, that the normal good manners of business uh, who don't raise prices when they first get hit with a cost shock because it's they don't want to lose customers and alienate them. Well, when everybody else is doing it, the whole the, the, the psychology changes and you have to you have to raise your price because if you don't, you're the, you're the, the last one left behind. And there is an element of that. And there's clearly uh, a, a, a process of, of 
of growing markups uh, in the system. The administration is now replenishing the SPR. Uh, and again, I don't know what's happening. I can't really speak to, to the supply situation, uh, but uh, it's quite possible. That, and certainly seems that the fall in the oil price has stopped uh, and there's been a little bit of recovery. What will happen next? I don't know. And then there's the fact that you raise interest rates and that's a cost of business. And so that too will be passed on. So there's, there's not as though the price risks have, have gone away, uh, but uh, uh, they, there's, that, that there's the, the measures that are uh, that would be most helpful in dealing with them have not been taken. Uh, there have not been the kind of selective inter, uh, interventions which could stabilize markups and prices. Um, there, so far as I know, is not a sustainable strategy in the energy sector, we'll see. Uh, and um, there's not been a the kind of regulatory environment that would control the financial sector if you move back to an upward sloping uh, yield curve. And finally, because I'm here at the Center for Peace and Development, I just point out that uh, supply chains, which cannot be deglobalized, do need peace. Uh, and the threat to peace is going to be a serious threat uh, to the cost structure going forward. Okay, thank you. That's the first part, and I managed to do it in about 45 minutes or 40 minutes. So I'm I'm, I'm happy to continue or to take a break and take your take a conversation and questions. And if we have a half, why don't we do that? Sure. Uh, and then I can I can bring in the other other piece uh, for those who might be interested uh, in uh, after we've done that. I think that what's happened in um, with labor is, is, is second order here. Uh, that um, first of all, what's 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 behind the reduction in labor supply? Mostly people who had left the services sector and didn't come back. Uh, and why not? Uh, partly they aged out and could access social security at age sixty-two, and partly the co the, the benefit at whatever wage they were getting paid of it was just not worth the trouble. Uh, uh, wait, working requires a cost, uh, commuting, childcare, whatever. Uh, and for the hours and wages, forget it. Just, they, they change the habits of their lives. I think those two things are the driving things. Well, yes, there is a little bit of, um, of, of uh, pressure on employers to raise wages as well as an increasing spread of the minimum wage at 15 around the country. Um, the effect of that on consumer prices is really very minor, uh, I think. Uh, they, uh, uh, she's not talking about a lot of a lot a lot of pressure on costs and the overall effect on wages. On is is you know looking at at medians or averages uh, is below the the the, cost, the 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 rise of prices. The, the really big spikes are in resource costs and and, and profits. Uh, so, yeah, there's a little bit of wage catch up, but there isn't anything that remotely compares to the Treaty of Detroit in the 50s and 60s when you had auto, rubber, and steel um, sort of lapping each other with, in, with pressure on, on, on collective bargaining settlements. Uh, and there isn't anything like the, you know, the, the, the public service sector wage uh, pressures that existed uh, in those years either. So uh, I'm, I'm inclined to think that this is, uh, and when Jason talks about higher wages, he's talking about the wages of people who are not well paid to begin with. Is it asked a follow-up question about that for mm. my economist? I'm not an economist. I'm not looking don't rub it in. Don't rub <laughs> it in. Uh, <laughs> you're, 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 that's a very sensitive point in a room like this. I, I'm a political economist. I told my students I'm not a real economist. Um, <laughs> So for the real economists in the room, just in response to this question, um, what I observe, and I'm, I don't observe too much looking at a lot of data, but I think the wage increases of lag have, have been really modest, is my impression. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, how do we explain the fact that labor shortages continue and employers do not seem to be raising wages to the level necessary to attract more employment? What's, what's going on there? understand that because you'd expect that you know I, I i mean certainly pervasive in oklahoma labor shortages everywhere you go and employers say i can't find 
support, but they're not raising wages above very, very modest levels. What's, what's going on? Good question, for which I don't have a have a, 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 a definitive answer. Well, I found um, your initial um, sort of definition of unemployment as far as well it's accepted by everybody. You tacked on at the prevailing wage. The end of your at the end. Of your I did, yeah. And I when you said that, I still don't mark it's clear. What do you mean by prevailing wage? And that was just essentially the question: Why isn't there an adjustment in price to? And maybe it's just a myth of of uh, a full employment's got to be four three percent unemployed or naturally four percent or that's a myth. But, I mean, it doesn't even make a whole lot of sense if markets do clear. Why, why isn't there an adjustment? Why isn't there? And why isn't there adjustment in wage to get rid of all the uh, unemployment? Well, I mean, I, I guess my my view is that the the uh, you're you're looking at even with relatively small businesses. Uh, you're you're looking at um, a a business decision, which is that if you raise the wage for someone you're just about want to hire, you have to raise the wage for everybody you've already got working for you, uh, and so you're looking at a difficult uh, proposition for you, for your bottom line, um, and so it, it you you try to avoid doing that for as long as possible. Uh, if, on the other hand, some authority, the government comes along, uh, the city of Norman, for example, and says, we're raising the minimum wage in defiance of the authority of the legislature of the state of Oklahoma, um, and, um, and everybody has to do it, then you're not at a disadvantage. Right? And so you just go along and you find, well, that a new system arises in which uh, the people working for you have more money in their pockets, and they what you lose in your on your costs you gain on your revenues. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that's that's quite different from one business making that decision independently, just at and you can't make that decision at the margin. I can't if I'm a restaurant uh, hire a server and say I'm going to pay you three dollars an hour more than I'm paying this other person. Because the other person will just walk out and come back in and say, "Hi, I want to be hired fresh." <laughs> you know? I mean, that's very that's that 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 doesn't work. So you're you're you you really have this inframarginal effect. I think that's the, the, probably the best answer to that question. Uh, Let me read a question, perhaps as next from the from the online one of our colleagues, uh, Sally Tabrizi asks. I'll just read it. I fully understand the importance of the everyday inflation shocks, such as price shocks. Controlling for such shocks, however, don't you think that the massive monetary expansion starting from March 2020 had a significant inflationary pressure? In that case, wouldn't an increase in federal funds rate, which has been quite effective in tightening M2, could in practice curb inflation? The answer to the question is no. I don't think the the the, uh, the piling on of of assistance to corporations that was who were. Uh, uh, you know, facing otherwise facing severe uh, funding shortages or uh, providing unemployment insurance to people who lost their incomes. I don't think that's per se inflationary at all. Uh, I mean, what actually happened was that, that as I said before, mostly in the household sector, uh, people carried on to, with their with their lives as normal uh, as they as normally as they could with the resources they were provided. Uh, and drew down any excess over time. There's nothing, no, 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 this did not put pressure on costs. Where you saw pressure of demand was, again, with the, the top quarter uh, uh, who uh, expanded their, their, their demand of uh, particularly durables, automobiles and appliances and electronics and everything that comes in on, on container ships. Well, that produced a backlog it produced um, uh, the, the 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 epic jam up in the ports. Uh, it probably pushed up some costs, shipping costs. It did push up shipping costs, uh, but um, in terms of uh, of of newly produced goods, th those prices don't go up. I mean, they went up some. They don't go up all that much. Uh, where you saw the effect in the consumer price index was in existing stocks used cars, existing housing. 
uh, and that's again that's an asset price effect. It's not a it's not a, a, a it's not technically an inflationary effect on on, on new production. So you know, yes, and, and the idea behind the behind that monetary push argument is that the 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 the, the world is full of households who are short of 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 purchasing power and who are desperate to to expand their purchases. Uh, that's not the world in which we live. In the, in, the, in, the, in the modern world, by and large, households with purchasing power have reserved purchasing power that they're not using. Uh, they have they have credit balances they 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 could they could exhaust, uh, and they they have pretty stable spending habits, by and large. So uh, this is really very different from the from the model that uh, that drives this sort of monetary push push theory. The uh, balance of spending power in the country is heavily weighted toward the upper echelons who are not in that category. So if you're thinking about inflationary pressure, it's the, the, the bottom 40% just don't matter all that much. I mean, they're, they're on to the, to the whole flow of demand. It's the, it's the top half uh, because of the, of, the, of the way in which the extremely unbalanced distribution of resources. A reference earlier to shocks and price adjustments. Um, when I think of the shock that sort of hit the housing market, one of the first things I think of is just how incapable supply side is of reacting quickly. Because I spend a lot of time thinking about like local land use regulations, the way the housing stock evolves uh, over time, and it's sort of notoriously sluggish, right, and inelastic, especially in the forward line. So, which do you see a role? Um, sort of for for federal policy for macro you know adjustments that would sort of pressure um, local governments who control you know in many in many situations control the housing stock in a way that is very sort of protective of uh, local owners' property values and sort of treating that asset as something that they're sometimes you know, trying to inflate really at the at the price of things like affordable housing and like using it as an exclusionary barrier to housing affordability. Right. Uh, an important question. Uh, what would be the, uh, the the right approach to this? I'm I'm a I, I, I'm in in my old age, and I've become a a a, a strong Georgist on this question, uh, or a Mason Gaffneyite. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the the idea that you should tax the value of the land and not the value of what's built on it would change a lot of things. It would change a lot of things. The purpose of doing that is to place a tax on all of the land owners who are not using their land, uh, particularly urban land, uh, for uh, its most effective use. Who are holding parking lots and uh, and and, de and decrepit buildings. Uh, I mean, they. Uh, in in my hometown, this is you can see this everywhere. Uh, they um, and what if they're if the tax is on the land value uh, and not on the on on the on the structure, most people's property taxes would go down, uh, but the taxes would fall on the on the unused land, which would then either be forfeited, in which case it would be developed, or the land owners would get busy and develop it in order to take and then and then in these problems would tend to tend to, to be. Uh, now this is, I think, about maybe about to happen in the city of Detroit. So we may see a very nice experiment, but there's lots of evidence. Uh, all of the northeast, well, midwestern cities, from Buffalo, Cleveland, Toledo, Milwaukee, Chicago, had this policy in the 19 teens and 20s, uh, and they, that's where the the city beautiful and the there was there was more electric power in Buffalo than in Paris uh, in this period. Uh, they uh, San Francisco. This is another great Mason Gaffney paper. Uh, had tax on land in 1906 when the earthquake destroyed the city, and by 1911 or 1912 the city was rebuilt uh, and had it was bigger than it was before. Uh, as the tax base didn't go away, and destroy the buildings but not the land. Uh, so uh, to my mind. This is, oh, I'll make one other observation about this, which is uh, some years ago, I encountered a paper by a Chinese 
scholar uh, who made the argument that, that Henry George was the most influential uh, uh, economist on the development of China, more or less by accident, not just because Sun Yat-sen was a Georgist, but because with the revolution, the landlords were expropriated. So the state got control of most of the land, controls the rents, and you end up with a sort of funnel of money. The rent money goes into infrastructure, which increases the rental money. Uh, and that is why, uh, go have a look at it, at Chinese cities. There's no, no phenomenon like this anywhere in the world that's even remotely close to the state of development that's happened in 40 or 50 years in China. Um, they may be losing some of that sales of land to private property, uh, but they, they certainly got, they certainly rode that one a long, long way. And, you know, you can look at American cities and, and it's, the development is largely arrested you know, to, by, in comparative terms. There's this idea that price level can be driven by fiscal factors. Mm -hmm. Basically how debt, government debt is financed. Right? So, um, you know, we give $2 trillion to populace that needs to be financed either through bonds or taxes or mm -hmm. staying your age. Uh, and so depending on how you how the government reacts to that, then that can drive the price level up. I wasn't sure if you, you didn't cover that possibility. Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess I didn't. Um, I'm not sure I would. Uh, the, um, I'm not sure how it's how it's materially different from the um, from the the proposition that I, I did cover. Is it basically how does the how does they, the how do the funds end up? In the hands of the private sector, well, that's that's a, that's a distribution. Uh, 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 it's a transfer. Uh, and again, the, important to remember that that type of of so-called government spending does not directly enter GDP. It is not about current production. It is it only enters GDP when the household spends on something on a final good. Uh, the government, of course, buys military equipment and it pays my, you know, the state government pays my salary and I guess your salaries and so forth. And we 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 contribute to GDP as we sit here providing goods and services to each other. Uh, mostly services, but there we are. Uh, but uh, if the government writes an unemployment check, that only enters GDP when the household goes to the grocery store. Uh, and so, again, there's no reason to top that up as a uh, a, a, as a direct burden on demand. You have to ask what the households did, do. And, you know, household behavior, it isn't what it was in the 19th century. It didn't just go directly down to the <laughs> to the, to the the tavern and, and, and drink it up. That's, that's not how households work in, in the modern society. My last minute, on maybe. I'm, I like to think economic policy is not in a vacuum but that there's a class and power dimensions into that. Mm -hmm. So then with the inflation debates over the Fed, the, most of the narrative is framed in such a way that either Fed is doing something wrong because they analyze, understand the causes of the inflation incorrect, or that they are doing the right thing, rather than that they are taking actually class interest. And terms like labor market tightening or wage push inflation, to me are not neutral value terms. Mm -hmm. Like unemployment rate going down, increasing labor's bargaining power, to some might be a good thing, to some others it might be a bad thing. So in this debate, and I know that you have another paper that you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, do you think the Fed's actually making a mistake or this is a conscious choice to weaken the growing labor movement from increasing unionization drive from Starbucks to Amazon mm -hmm. to bring the wages back to where they should be perhaps? And it would address people quitting the labor force. The participation rate has been falling already mm -hmm. for two decades. It's not a new thing. Mm -hmm. It didn't just happen after the pandemic. But part of the reason why the participation rate is going down is because wages have been stagnating or declining since 1971. So how do you see that like regarding the Fed taking an active stance regarding a increasing labor bargaining power? And to stop that before it reaches yeah. anything. I, I don't think of the Federal Reserve as uh, as uh, heavily staffed by um, by Marxists. Um, yeah, there may be a few time right there. Uh, so uh, while it is certainly true that 
uh, at the start of my career in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, this was a, uh, and even under the Carter administration before before Reagan, uh, the the conflict was with the unions. Uh, that's not true anymore. There's just simply not not that power of it base. Uh, so when I think about what the enduring and permanent uh, interest of the Federal Reserve are, I'm reminded of a comment that was made to me by an old friend of mine, a monetarist, Alan Meltzer, uh, who's now no longer with us and therefore cannot deny having said this uh, to me. He said, you know, the Fed always works for the big banks. That's where they're, this is a central bank. It's uh, constituency is the bank. It's prime constituency is the banking sector. The banking sector, the American banking sector, is an, is a global phenomenon. And so I see the 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 the, the, the rock basis of the Fed, of Fed policy to be defense of those interests and defense of the dollar as the center of the global financing system. I don't see how it could be really anything else. I think that was, you know, again, the, the two things, the, the crushing of the labor movement and the reestablishment of the dollar were both in the mix in 1979. But it was the, it was the precipitating event in 79 was, uh, was, was Volcker uh, went to Belgrade to an IMF meeting uh, and really got an earful about the, the, the position of the dollar, which at that time was declining uh, against the Deutsche Mark and the Japanese yen. And he came back and stopped the, the turn, you know, froze the wheels of the, of the world by raising interest rates. The dollar went up, uh, if you, in trade weighted terms, by 60%. Conventional measure was 40%, but if you weighed it against Mexico and Canada and Japan, it was a 60% increase. And from that point forward, the world shifted to a completely fiat dollar-based system, right? which has been going, been going on for 40 years. Is it coming to an end? That's the big question right now, right? I mean, there's I, there, that's a sort of an issue. Uh, it's very hard to replace a, the single big debt market of the United States government, uh, but uh, there's certainly an effort to do so centered on China, on Russia, Iran. Uh, the Eurasian uh, Union uh, is setting up a non-dollar zone. Why? Because we've sanctioned them. We basically said we're cutting you off. And in the case of Russia, we're freezing frozen 300 billion of if we found them, I don't think we did, but that was the idea to prevent them to get access to uh, the U.S. government bonds held by uh, non-Russian central banks, uh, and, uh, which is where, of course, they are held. There, it's, 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 it's an account at the New York Fed by and large. Uh, so um, that's a uh, um, uh, a question of whether there will be a stable enduring non-dollar, non-euro zone. Uh, and that would be something new in the world system, not something not seen since since the since the 70s or, or, or earlier. Uh, maybe not really seen since the interwar period. Uh, and so um, we'll see. But I think that dealing with that, if you ask what is the Fed, what is driving the inner councils of the Fed on which I do not sit, uh, I would, uh, I would put that in the first place, uh, in the first place. Um, other questions? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, 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 to turn to the other set of, uh, and just say a few, uh, maybe sure. a little bit. Yeah, uh, the, why don't I, I find the others. So this, this was a paper that a uh, uh, couple of co-authors um, Anne Russo is a student, Olivier Giovanni is a junior faculty member, and I did uh, in 2007, and it's available. And what it, what it did was to look at the interest rate policies of the Federal Open Market Committee over the period 69 to 2006. So covering the last major inflationary episode from 69 to 83, the aftermath from 84 to 2006, as, as I said, well, we did submit it to it a top journal, it was considered to be um, 
les measures day. Nobody found anything wrong with the econometrics, but the conclusions were so drastically inconvenient that it's only, I just left it up on the website after that. Um, um, but also the fact was that from 2007 onward, the, the financial crisis was a much more important phenomenon. And so there was not uh, really any uh, great interest in anti-inflation policy until 2021. Um, and question in the paper was, uh, what does the Fed do? <laughs> and there's a first part of the paper, which I won't present or discuss today, which is, which was a series of Granger causality tests. Um, and as I say, you can skip it. Uh, that was partly there as, 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 as I have to confess as a form of camouflage to try and uh, get it past the referees, but no, it didn't work. Uh, the second part is what I want to talk about, which is a set of dummy regressions, uh, uh, which measured the way in which the Open Market Committee reacted to ways in, changes in the uh, economic and political environment, and particularly inflation and unemployment and the uh, eminence of, of, of elections, the presidential elections. Um, we chose the yield curve as the dependent variable, uh, which is the difference between uh, the, the rate on 90 day bills and 10 year T bonds. And the reason for this is that as you look at this, it's basically trendless. It does not, uh, and it does not ap appear to be affected by whether you're in a high inflation or a low inflation environment. Uh, so uh, when the yield curve goes inverted, uh, as you can see, it also is a fairly consistent indicator of the, uh, of, of the onset of a, of a recession, maybe not immediately, but relatively so. Uh, so it's a good measure of the stance of monetary policy for, an, for a long-term analysis. Um, they, um, but what we did was a series of models, uh, and I could try and uh, characterize them quite quickly. Uh, one of them is the first model is uh, if inflation was above uh, a, uh, a, 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 a ostensible target, if it was rising, if unemployment was below or if unemployment was falling, so levels and changes separately on each. Uh, on each uh, variable. Model two uh, was to, again, four, four dummies, but the first one, they indicate whether uh, the uh, inflation rate indicated tightening because it was both above target and rising or below target and falling, and similarly for the unemployment. And model three was the pure case of the Taylor rule inflation and above and, and unemployment below, inflation below and unemployment above, in which case the rule unambiguously says you either tighten or, or ease. And then finally for completeness, if all the variables indicated you should tighten or all the variables indicated. So there are four different ways of specifying this particular uh, uh, response function. And here's what we found for the first sub period. And then there was a structural change <coughs> Uh, no, not surprised in the early 1980s that uh, caused us to break this into two. The red uh, coefficients are those which uh, um, are were statistically significant, uh, and they show that in the 69 period, uh, the in, uh, a policy would tighten if inflation was above uh, the uh, target, uh, if unemployment was below the target. Uh, it would tighten if uh, and ease if um, if uh, inflation would inflation easing would cause it to ease and, and unemployment uh, tightening would cause it to tighten. Um, and the Taylor uh, 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 specification was as also as expected as with the uh, the uh, the fourth model. The R squared is is very low, but. Uh, uh, but we'll move on to the second period. In the second period, uh, the, the Fed, the, the inflation significance completely disappears. Uh, and the, and we, what we see is the Fed responds by tightening when the unemployment rate is below target uh, or when the unemployment rate indicates that it should, it should tighten on both 
uh, the, the level and rate of change. Uh, so that's a very interesting uh, change. Now that's partly because the inflation rate ceases to be a factor. There just isn't much of it going on. Uh, but what you can see is that in this period, even though the inflation rate has disappeared, there is evidence that the Federal Reserve reacted to a, a tight labor market, to a favorable employment situation by tightening policy. That, that of course, raises some questions because uh, the federal law uh, calls for a policy, including monetary policy, that uh, supports full employment. Uh, price, reasonable price stability, balanced growth. Uh, I actually drafted another long story, the monetary policy provisions of the Humphrey Hawkins bill that was advanced in the House. Nobody thought those were interesting at the time. It turned out to be the only uh, piece of the bill that actually had any force over time, but uh, the, uh, that's why it was assigned to, a, how old was I, 23 at the time. Um, yeah, but in any event, um, that gives you a sense of the underlying uh, direction and the, the force of the Federal Reserve policy in this period. Um, but then there was another question. When you take all of those into account, um, is there any difference uh, on account of the political cycle? Is there any difference, particularly in the way we specified it, it was in an election year, if, the, if a Democrat is the incumbent or a Republican, is the incumbent. Those are the two, the two dummy variables, and we added those to the mix. Uh, and what we found was the following: over all the specifications of the different models, the policy is significantly easier if a Republican is incumbent, and significantly tighter if a Democrat is the incumbent. And the effect is um, uh, uh, about three hundred basis points. So it is a very significant difference in the political stance in an election year, such as we are about to experience fairly soon. Uh, now, of course, again, there's no reason to believe that this model, which is estimated over a period in the distant past, now this is 69 to, uh, uh, and this is through 2006, same result, uh, and in fact, significant in all, in all models, but one, it's one exception in the earlier period. Uh, so. Uh, one has to ask, what is the, is there a structural uh, reason for this? Well, uh, it is, of course, the habit of Republican presidents to reappoint Republican chairs and for Democratic presidents mostly to reappoint Republican chairs with very limited exceptions. Uh, and a habit, of course, of the, of, of the, of the Fed as whole for the, members appointed by Republicans to be more hawkish, members appointed by Democrats to be equally hawkish because they, they feel sensitive to their political <laughs> reputations. So that there's a very great asymmetry here, which shows up in election years. Uh, again, is this going to be something which we'll see in 2024? Well, we have uh, certainly a, uh, uh, we certainly have statements from some parts of the Federal Reserve establishment and supporting economists claiming that the tight policy needs to continue all through uh, 2023 and 2024. Whether it will or not, I think depends a little bit on events, uh, but at least that would be from the basis, from the statistical analysis, my presumption. Basic conclusions. Monetary policy does not aim at fighting inflation because there's no evidence that inflation mattered very much in the period after 83. The Federal Reserve is not indifferent to unemployment. It reacts when unemployment is low uh, and, raise, and, and, and raises the rates. Uh, that it fights inflation, um, it does not appear to ease, that it fights some recessions, it does not appear to ease significantly simply because unemployment is high. Uh, and the final conclusion, uh, is that uh, there is, in fact, a very substantial political asymmetry in the behavior of the Federal Reserve in this period in which you're estimating. Uh, the, uh, this is a, a, a picture of the yield curve up through November of 2022, and you can see uh, that it has already come about as tight uh, as it has it was at any time uh, in the uh, period going back 
uh, to, uh, well, this is, goes back to the early 80s. Um, and uh, and I've, I've got uh, the president of the New York Fed, who is by all odds the most influential of the uh, open market committee members from the regional banks, uh, the only one who sits on every, on every year doesn't rotate. Uh, saying that the inflation flight could last into 2024. So uh, I am sure there is no politics involved in such a statement. But on the other hand, don't say you weren't warned. And OK, a little bit of self-promotion. Mm -hmm. I've been I've been beating this drum for some time. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that, having quoted uh, one of the great phrases that uh, uh, I learned on the staff in honor of the chairman of the uh, uh, of the Committee on Ways and Means in the early 1980s, Dan Rostenkowski, who said, he that tooteth not his own horn, the same shall not be tooted. That's it. Hi, we still have a few minutes for questions. So, so some, I mean, it's a sad story you're telling, and, and, and it's, it's probably hard to answer this question if it's even a decent question, but to what extent is the Fed fooling itself in thinking that it's fighting inflation when it's actually not, and to what extent are they just lying to us? I mean, is it corruption or ignorance, from your perspective, that causes this faulty policy, faulty actions, faulty rhetoric? Um, well, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not inclined to accuse public servants of lying. Um, they, uh, but, um, I think that the, um, the dialogue that affects the Fed passes through a certain kind of set of semantic and linguistic filters, uh, which put phrase things in terms of inflation, even though the underlying motivation may be quite different. And so if you are the chairman of the Fed, and particularly if you're, um, well, uh, if you're a lawyer, which Chairman Powell is, uh, then you're going to be taking your brief from uh, you know, what's presented to you. Uh, and that's, the, 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 so there's, is there a level of of uh, obfuscation, self delusion, uh, or uh, framing of the issue uh, in terms that will make it acceptable in what's presented uh, to the chairman of the Fed? I think that's what uh, that would be my 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 interpretation of how that of uh, how we get a a talk about inflation um, when on the underlying forces for the policy are quite different. I mean, for, I mean the Phillips curve is a nice example of this. And though it's a completely defunct doctrine, uh, it, uh, it enables you to translate very quickly from a low unemployment environment to a higher inflation environment. There's no evidence that this has actually been relevant. And it was not, was hardly any evidence for it during the brief period that it, that it was considered relevant, but it stuck. Uh, as a, so you can talk about uh, about inflation when the unemployment is low, uh, and the people remember this from their textbooks. So it makes it makes an argument which has as a you know, path of least resistance. Um, so, many, so many times the sound bite it's hard to get rid of. Say so what? So, so oftentimes a sound bite like the Phillips curve so easy for the uh, semi-educated American who understands the Phillips curve to ever. Eradicated because it's just so short and quick and clear. Uh, that yeah, no, that's I, I, I think I think this was the the genius of, yeah. of of the Phillips curve. Well, I mean, it was um, like the soundbite of the government's the problem, not the solution. Let, 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 I mean, you see, you go back to the 1950s um, and you think about Sandelson and Solow when they what they were doing was uh, they had at that point you had the Hicks Hansen ISLM framework, which related interest rates to uh, to the level of, of, of income. Uh, and that's not what politicians were interested in. Politicians were interested in, they weren't interested in GDP, they were interested in unemployment. They were interested in inflation. That was the dialogue. 
the Phillips curve fit that like a glove. Uh, and so, uh, and then it embedded itself in the textbook literature. And then this, all of this um, uh, Friedman Phelps uh, gloss on it with throwing in expectations came kind of a, uh, I remember this when I was in graduate school, sort of a, was the clever argument of that particular period, how the Phillips curve would turn long run vertical. Well, the Phillips curve was always <laughs> horizontal. The real world, the Phillip, there was no such relationship. From time to time, cost shocks would come in, OPEC, Vietnam. Uh, and then the price level would go up after the unemployment rate had been falling. You draw that on a chart, it looks like a curve. That doesn't mean it has any structural relationship there at all. It has never been the case that a falling unemployment rate was per se inflationary. Uh, inflation could be, you could get wage pressures, but that was always a always on a fully employed labor part of the labor force and the highly unionized people who had leverage, who couldn't easily be replaced. The unemployment, something else, something else. And now with that industrial base gone and the overwhelming body of the labor force basically in, in, in very stable wage services, there's just no reason to think there's any such relationship. Okay, I think we are out of time anyway. So we have used our time, and I yeah, yield back the balance much. of my time. Thank you. Thank you.